The left is always inclined to look on the grim side of things. Always inclined to look on the grim side of things. The cup is always half empty. Until you point out, it. look, it's half full. It doesn't look so bad. <laughs> Welcome to Political Ginger Vitus, the crazy and zany podcast for progressives who need a laugh. I'm your hostess with the mostest, Andrew Stewart, and this week we're going to try to put a smile on your face and maybe a few thoughts in your head. Sunday, April 6, 1941, Germany launched a whirlwind attack on the Balkan Kingdom of Yugoslavia. The country put up little resistance. German losses were slight, but the punishment they inflicted was frightful. In Belgrade, the capital, which Hitler ordered to be taught a lesson, 10,000 people were killed by bombs. After nine days, Yugoslavia surrendered. That seemed to be the end of it. Instead, it turned out to be the beginning of a partisan uprising, led by a man who had spent his life as a communist revolutionary disguised beneath a number of aliases. Josip Broz, or as the world came to know him, Tito. And what do the brave grandchildren of these partisans, led today by the Democratic Party, say in response to the vile leadership of Donald Trump? Ah! in your general direction. Your mother was a hamster and your father smelt of elderberries. Hello, friends. This is your host, Andrew Stewart, today, and I welcome you again to another episode of Political Gingivitis, the funny and zany podcast for progressives who need a laugh. If you're like me in the last couple weeks, you probably have been seeing the Democratic Party behaving in a fashion that is less than admirable, mostly in half-hearted ways on key issues such as health care or the approval of Trump's cabinet picks or just about everything else under the sun. Um, personally, I am not involved with the Democratic Party. I respect people in their base who are trying to change it from the inside, but I also am deeply, deeply skeptical of the motivations of the Democratic Party leadership and anyone attached to that organization. Today, we are going to start off with a conversation with labor historian and activist Dr. Mark Nason. He is the author of a load of books and has been active for many years in regards to opposition to standardized testing and school privatization. But right now, we're sitting down to talk about a book he wrote 30 years ago titled Communists in Harlem During the Depression, which is probably one of the finer labor histories that I have ever read. And I think it's an important book for us to be reading and studying in the coming weeks and months because it's a fascinating case study of what happens when you try to build a third political party on the left that has connection to the labor and cultural institutions of a heterogeneous community in an urban setting during a time of economic downturn with no viable sign of real economic upswing in the near future uh, because, of course, the New Deal, while it certainly has many, many important parts that are worth talking about, we also need to remember that it was essentially a very racist set of legislative policies that did almost nothing for people of color. And so what the Communist Party did in Harlem during the Depression is a fascinating and important 
example for us to take heed from in the next few years. Here is Dr. Nason and I having our conversation recently. So uh, one of the things that has been obvious in the past couple months is that we are seeing an upsurge of activism in both black politics and mainstream left liberal political. Mm -hmm. And right. I was wondering what sort of similarities and differences you can see in comparison to the period you studied with the communists in Harlem. Well, I think one of the things is there's not any organized group on the left which can bridge barriers between different constituencies um, the way the Communist Party tried to do between African Americans, between different groups in the labor movement. Even at the times their strategies were not effective, there was still some sort of methodology that aimed at unifying diverse left-wing uh, and grassroots organizations to try to maximize their power. Mm -hmm. I don't see anything like that out there now at all. And it, you know, I sometimes say to people, I understand why we don't have a communist party, but we sure could use something like it, which can operate both above ground and underground, which has linkages in a lot of different parts of the country. Um, you know, so like, just to give an example of the kinds of things that a communist party could do, which and the CP didn't have a very diverse um, base in New York City, let's say in the Irish community. Mm -hmm. um, and if you wanted to organize in the transit system, you know, uh, especially in the subways, the workforce was very heavily Irish. So what they did was gave some Finnish communist Irish names and sent them down into the subway to try to recruit Irish radicals. And they actually found a few, one of whom was Mike Quill, who ended up becoming the lead, who and who was a leader of like Clan Nagale, an important Irish fraternal organization. And they persuaded him to work with them. Um, I don't know if there's, uh, or let's say Flint, you're organizing the, uh, you know, trying to organize in the auto plants. You had secret ethnic communists who were there who could work with the union organizers. We don't have anything. I mean, there's no coordination between constituencies that I can see, not in New York City and not around the country. Um, so to some degree, you have the Democratic Party being almost like a surrogate for left-wing groups, and the Democratic Party is the opposite of left-wing because it, you know, it's so tied into its uh, Wall Street and and um, tech uh, donors. So I think we're actually in worse shape than we were in the '30s even though in the 1920s was a period of reaction, because there's, I don't see any kind of strategic effectiveness being generated anywhere right now. Right. And uh, so it's like you have a lot of disparate uh, organizations in, with different constituencies operating, you know, and they pass each other, you know, uh, and occasionally work together. But I don't see anything effective uh, uh, operating to unify different groups or unifying the any sort of resistance. Uh, I'm very pessimistic at what I see right now. Right. Uh, now, maybe in certain cities, this is taking place. It's not taking place in New York, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean there is an activism. There's a lot of like resistance around immigration issues. Um, and there's some resistance around testing and education issues. 
And there are people organizing around health care who mm-hmm. fight for 15. But nobody, it's, none of it is connected in any way that I can see. So um, it, it, uh, the right seems to be better organized than the left. Right. Uh, and uh, unless you're seeing something that I don't, I don't see that changing anytime soon. Certainly. I mean, um, there have been many instances where uh, the strangest bedfellows have seemed to come out of the woodwork in Providence, it seems, around issues that, because we're just a, essentially a democratic machine state, uh, mm-hmm. the kind of populist upsurge against business as usual has led to some very interesting moments of unity um one of the parts in your book that is very fascinating and particularly striking in comparison to now is when you had the cultural overlap where daily worker was running jazz reviews and doing baseball coverage of the negro league and calling for integration and those sorts of things but but again at that particular point in time, you had a communist party, which was deeply embedded in the labor movement all over the country. Everything from you know organizing sharecroppers and tobacco workers to auto workers, steel workers, uh, the uh, maritime workers and seamen, longshoremen. And you also had, you know, the, the threat of fascism emerging abroad which brought intellectuals to seek an alliance with the working class left. Mm -hmm. I don't, I mean, if there was an anti-fascist alliance, uh, and I would love to see it aimed at sort of Trump and the, and, uh, the alt right, I'm not seeing it. I'm sorry. Why isn't there this incredible artistic upheaval taking place? I don't see it. Right. I don't see it on the universities. My students were totally passive before the election, and only a handful of them are kind of active now. They don't like Trump very much, but there's no, I don't pick up any sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a sense of urgency among, you know, people who work with immigrants for sure. You know, and I'm involved in that in the box. So we're organizing forums and defense stuff. But that's totally disconnected from other issues. And where are, you know, where are our musicians? Where are the artists? Where is the guerrilla theater? Where's the street theater? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not seeing it. Why isn't the whole city plastic with anti-Trump graffiti or anti-Bannon graffiti? What? Um, so I think we're way behind the eight ball. Right. Um, and again, you know, the fact that there's no left organization, even a flawed one that is coordinating anything means that everything is like, you know, is very localized Mm -hmm. An issue, single issue organizing um that occasionally coordinates but when it does coordinate it's like often through the democratic party which many people you know which is a deeply flawed instrument so there's you know nothing crystallized around let's say bernie bernie the two left-wing upsurges with the bernie campaign and occupy wall street and neither of those created organizational vehicles that have any kind of staying power. Right. And, and um, which is somewhat disturbing because if they had, we'd be in a little better shape. We're between single issue organizing and sort of the Democratic Party. And I don't think that's going to cut it. Yeah, I uh you know, I talked with Jeffrey. Unless you're seeing something that I'm not. Well, I was talking with Jeffrey St. Clair about his recent book, and he said that, listen, Sanders 
did not conjure this thing out of nothingness. This was a movement that's existed since the World Trade Organization protests in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And it's been there and it's, it was there for him to tap into. And it was pretty obvious by a certain point in the whole campaign, actually Sanders was way into something that he never expected. And mm -hmm. it's... When I go to these protests, it's almost akin to the cartoon where the crazy dog is pulling that dog walker who doesn't want to get bit. You know, the, you've got a couple progressive Democrats who are trying to keep control, but they're just barely. And mm -hmm. I certainly agree that very quickly on the horizon, a divorce is going to be coming with the Democrats and... Um, Creating a political third party force is certainly a challenge, um, but I think it, it absolutely is. I mean, because even in the '30s, the CP ended up never really generating a powerful third party force, and you know they were sort of became like a left opposition within the Democratic Party, occasionally local labor party. What? What? One of the sections and passages that was especially interesting in that regard was how a philip randolph and the uh adam clayton powell jr candidacies would interact with the cp and i was wondering if you could talk briefly about that well you know look the uh the, the cp was very effective at working with certain kinds of black political leaders um, who uh, managed to kind of keep their independence but found the CP a very useful ally because they had resources. So um, if, if you have a left which has some resources, which has a press, which has a labor wing, which has volunteers, they can cut deals with progressive Democratic politicians. There's no question that could happen. But you have to have something to offer. That's what I'm worried about. You know, what, what left organization has anything to offer in terms of resources? Mm -hmm. Right. The CP had bodies, it had money, it had a press, it had organizations, it had some supportive unions. So they could work with a Vito Marcantonio or an Adam Clayton Powell, you know, pretty easily. Uh, and but there are there are progressive like in New York City, who or, and and the public advocate. There's some great people like Letitia James and uh, Brad Landon. And the problem is that there's no organization that crosses boundaries that could make resources available if another progressive politician decided to challenge one who was more moderate. Right. I get what you're you, saying. You, you know, you have to have some sort of like you know, left-wing political machine that could operate to help progressive candidates. Mm -hmm. Um. And that means, you know, money and volunteers and a press and, you know, knocks on doors. Right. There, I don't see where that there's anything like that. Mm. And the unions used to play that role a little bit. And they're so on the defensive that they can't do it. Right. So we have, there's a real absence of, of resources here. Mm -hmm. That can be put at the disposal of progressive political candidates or important organizing strategies. And unless people decide to create that kind of machinery, you know, we're going to still be at a disadvantage. I, uh, uh, now, can you create a communist party without a communist party? No, the equivalent of a, a national organization with an underground, above-ground wing which can operate within um, 
you know, mass organizations and unions, which has resources to bring to bear and things, which can operate secretly sometimes when necessary. Can people create that kind of a network? I don't see anybody trying to do it. Right. Unless I'm missing something. Right. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm very pessimistic right now. I understand. About about what I, I see. Now, uh, I don't see um, people organizing that, that kind of progressive grassroots force capable of influencing elections. Mm-hmm. I don't see artists stepping forward to create a culture of resistance. I don't see the kind of mass guerrilla theater that we had in the 60s, which like utterly t- took over public space. Mm-hmm. I just see a lot of like people grumbling to one another about how Trump sucks and the country is racist. Mm-hmm. I mean, then they're right. Right. Trump sucks in the country. But it's not anything anybody would feel. Right. So, um, so until, you know, we become scarier to, look, to compromising politicians because we can sway elections, well, not much is going to happen. Right. We almost have to depend on the goddamn Republicans to control Trump, not us. Mm. That's really sad. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, in this sense, the communists, even in Harlem, they did start from a very small group. And I know it's been a while for you, but I wonder if you could just... Yeah, they started from a small group, but they had a structure. Right. That allowed them to consolidate. But now you start a small group, but there's no structure, there's no methodology, mm. there's no strategy. Yeah. I'm fine with starting small if you're going somewhere. But where are you going? What's your organizational model? How are you going to recruit people? How are you going to keep people? Mm hmm. How are you going to have you? And you have to do some stuff secretly. How is that going to be organized? Right. Um, I mean, it would be wonderful if people studied the Communist Party and created one without a Soviet Union and without some or many of the more disturbing elements of Leninism. Mm-hmm. But you have to have some discipline, commitment. To growing and in and, and acquiring power and resources. Right. I do. Money, a press, members, mm-hmm. votes. Yeah, I certainly uh, the, do. The power to take control of an organization. Right. And I certainly do recognize that one of the things that seems to have replaced traditional no- modes of organization has been the way Facebook and the internet kind of sucks people into mm-hmm. behaving online as if they would on a picket line. Yeah, right. Well, there's some of that. But it's also, look, I mean, Occupy Wall Street and Black Lives Matter had strong elements of anarchism in it. Mm-hmm. And I'm yet to be convinced that anarchism is, you know, can transmit into effective strategies for uh, acquiring and keeping power. Right. On the part of subaltern groups. I'm not convinced it can do that. Right. Certainly. So, we're, I mean, if people aren't ready to create Disciplined organizations which try to acquire and keep power, I I just think we're going to keep losing. Right. Um, Are there any points about um, how the Communist Party 
addressed this within the larger theme of the national question that you think are worth talking about? Well, see, I don't think, see, to me, it's not so much a question of theory. Right. As structure. Okay. I mean, their, their position on the national question varied, you know, from the self-determination in the back black belt to uh, a position which was more, um, you know, um, like African Americans are a, you know, a portion of the working, an oppressed portion of the working class more than an oppressed nationality. Um, but in whatever it was, they had a, first of all, they were a global movement. They had connections all over ties all over the world and they were disciplined. Mm -hmm. And I think, see, to me, until you, have a different orientation towards power. Mm -hmm. I don't think your ideology around the national question or matters that much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think once people say, okay, we need to start winning elections, taking over unions, taking over school boards, Taking over city councils. Right. Until we get to that point, then I, I, don't, you know, I don't think it, it matters much, you know, how we look at race or gender or other issues. Okay. That you get to that point, then those questions become very serious and you've got to work out a, a, an approach that works for people. Right. But right now, it's just like blowing hot air. Right. Pardon my, you know. No, you're exactly Talk right. Talk to me when you do something. Right. I don't, you know. Certainly. So I, I think it has to have an orientation to actually taking power. Mm -hmm. But if you're afraid of power... Right. And, you know, that's the anarchist, the suspicion of power. Then you're just, you're not going to move forward. And the other side is not afraid of power. They love power. Right. They. Right. And, I mean, what are your thoughts on um, what Ralph Nader has been saying? He's pointed out 25 different positions where basically progressives and libertarians are all in agreement on I don't think it matters. Right. I don't think I don't think issues matter. Okay. I think organization matters. Okay. At this point. I got you. Are, are there Until any other people who consider themselves on the left decide to create organizations aimed at seizing power in union school boards city councils, Congress, and right. every other place where resources are being distributed, you know, then it, everything just becomes a debating society. Right. Okay. To me, my biggest influences organizationally were the Communist Party and the Mafia. Yeah. <laughs> I grew up in a Mafia-dominated neighborhood. Right. So, like, I build a political base wherever I go by having people obligated to me. I do favors for people. People owe me. Right. So if I need something done, there are foreign administrators who owe me. There are people in the, com there are former students who owe me. There are people in the community who I can bring people together to fight out of mutual obligation, not ideology. Gotcha. They owe me because I've done stuff for them. They need help. I'll do it. Makes sense. But that's the pol that's a political machine. Right. And that's, you know, and to a lot of people, that's sacrilege on the left. Right. That makes sense. You know, look, I'm about winning. Exactly. I'm an ex-athlete, too. So right. I have everything wrong. Right. For these people. People want to be righteous. 
They treat it like a religion. Yeah, it's or or some sort of marker of personal authenticity. Right. I mean, um, I was talking with somebody who was both in the uh, Revolutionary Communist Party, but then became a pastor later, and he said there are people who treat this stuff in a form of Gnosticism, essentially. Yeah, I, it's it's a very... I mean, so to me, the issue is you get a critical mass of people to start meeting secretly for how we are going to protect vulnerable people and gain power. Two things. How do you protect people under attack, especially immigrants? And you can't do that publicly. You have to meet secretly. Mm-hmm. And how are we going to gain power? Right. Gotcha. Critical men and meet secretly. Find the people you who are serious enough to be willing to meet privately to address those two questions. Protecting vulnerable people and gradually taking power right. away from, from people who are using it destructively. Let me run this idea by you. What do you think about the fact that the force that actually got real results and actually did the whole thing and something else were the abolitionists and they were opposing as a po- instead of saying put something forward I th- my point being when you're angry at something and when you're in opposition that lights a fire under your bottom in a different fashion yeah but re- but remember the abolition of what ultimately moved the civil war was the creation of the republican party which was seeking political power Right. Okay. You have to, I mean, you have to have those fire in your belly oppositional people, but you also have to have people who seek power. Right. And and preferably both. Sometimes it's a division of labor, and sometimes people have one side in public and one side in secret. Okay. You don't have to confess your goddamn soul to the world. Right. Every time. You know, you have certain things that you just talk about amongst yourselves that you're not going to share with the public. Right. You don't tell everybody what you're doing. I got you. You do it. But it's it's this, the stuff I'm talking about is not, it's very different from the politics of personal authenticity. Right. Okay. Are there any other points you'd like to bring up in closing? Well, again, what I'd say is bring what I and I tell I told people after Trump was elected, especially people operating conservative areas, get a group of, of five to ten people you trust and start meeting secretly and figuring out what you need to do. Right. Okay. Do not meet in public. Mm-hmm. Okay. Create organ. You know, don't tell the opposition what you're doing. Gotcha. Okay. This isn't about validating yourself. It's about protecting people and gaining power. Two things. Protect the vulnerable and compete for power. Gotcha. Then the same question I put to him in America. Critics say his films have social meaning, significance. Is that true? Not at all. I think that's one of the phoniest kind of phony devices that some writers use. They're not satisfied just to see something funny. They have to see significance in it. And we have never planned on having any significance in anything we ever did. We were just trying to make the audience laugh. And I remember there was a show in New York open called Bandwagon. This was a musical with Frank Morgan and the Astaires were in there. And Frank Morgan came out before the curtain and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I know there's a lot of plays in New York with social significance. Don't regard this as one of them. All we're going to try to do here is to make a little money. There was one fellow, he was a wonderful writer. The day after we opened an animal crackers on Broadway, he wrote a piece, mostly about me, in which he said that I was the embodiment of the Jewish oppression that it 
It's gone on for 2,000 years. It's the goddamnedest kind of reviewing. <laughs> As I said, well, all we were trying to do was be funny, and he, oh, he had everything in there. He had hunks of the Bible in there and everything. Now, we were astonished by this. Later, I had somebody explain it to me, but I didn't, we didn't understand it at all. But people do that. They review books, too, sometimes, which are just meant to be comic or funny, and uh, they see all kinds of things in that that really don't exist except in their own minds. And now we have an interview with Glenn Ford. He is the executive editor of Black Agenda Report, one of the finer podcasts today on uh, the airwaves that you can possibly listen to. And we are discussing his reportage on the career and trajectory of one Cory Booker. Ford was at the very beginning taking notes about Cory Booker and has some important insights that are worth paying attention to as we see Booker beginning to be lined up as potentially the next Democratic Party politician to head towards the White House nomination if perhaps Hillary Clinton somehow miraculously decides not to run in 2020. First time you heard about Cory Booker and what you noticed as you began to see him develop and bloom as this figurine in the brand line of black neoliberal politics. Well, I'd known about Cory Booker because I had covered him for a small black uh, New Jersey newspaper that I helped start uh, off and on for for a while. Uh, I was not impressed by him. Uh, he didn't have even a good record of attendance at the Newark City Council. He was 31 years old at the time. He was prone uh, to uh, gimmicky demonstrations uh, uh, just to get uh, uh, press coverage. Uh, and I knew uh, that his national political coming out uh, had been uh, at a power luncheon of the Manhattan Institute, uh, which is uh, one of the uh, New York uh, stars of the uh, right-wing constellation of, of think tanks and media-influencing uh, outfits. And uh, being invited to a power luncheon of the Manhattan Institute is basically an introduction uh, to the folks on the right, on the corporate right, uh, basically saying he's one of ours. But I really didn't uh, pay that much attention because, again, he was just a 31-year-old first-term Newark City Councilman who wasn't making uh, much of an impression uh, in his hometown, or rather the town that he adapted, adopted. Uh, but when he declared his candidacy for mayor uh, in early 2002, uh, I immediately went uh, to uh, the web after going to uh, his uh, campaign uh, speech uh, to see what kind of reaction there was in the press. And what shocked me uh, was not just that all the press co uh, coverage that he got, and Newark, New Jersey, uh, wasn't in the habit of getting lots of press coverage for anything uh, political, any of its political developments, but that the whole damn Internet lit up in terms of uh, the whole entire constellation of right-wing organizations. They were all saying, go Corey. They knew him by his first name. And I'm talking about every conceivable right-wing corporate-funded organization uh, was intimately familiar with this char uh, character, uh, Cory Booker, who I thought was just an obscure uh, councilman uh, in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, and that had a profound effect on the political direction of the Black Commentator, which was the uh, internet political uh, journal that I was about uh, to co-found uh, in March of 2002. What it showed was that uh, the uh, corporate right, uh, which uh, we associate, of course, with the Republican Party, uh, and which had been uh, dabbling in black politics only on uh, the level of black Republicans uh, and uh, solitary conservative black uh, academics, uh, people uh, like uh, Steele and uh, Thomas Sowell 
And as I said, black Republicans who had not elected one of their own to a majority black district uh, since uh, the last black Republican congressman left the scene in 1935, uh, that they were uh, getting their their feet wet in black politics uh, for the first time uh, with, uh, among other candidates, uh, Cory Booker. Uh, Cory Booker, uh, as soon as he declared his candidacy, uh, had a campaign war chest uh, full of contributions that were equal to uh, or more uh, than that of the incumbent four-term mayor. Uh, who was thought to be the most powerful black politician in New Jersey. But immediately, Cory Booker was outspending him. Uh, Cory Booker got the endorsement of the totality of the corporate media, uh, the newspapers and radio stations, which had never had not paid attention uh, to Newark uh, politics since the first black mayor was elected in Newark in 1970. But they all... Uh, knew his name, and that's when I made the connection uh, to the Manhattan Institute and said, well, they must have uh, engineered uh, this. And Cory Booker uh, came within a few thousand votes of unseating uh, Sharp James, uh, the incumbent mayor, uh, when he made his first run in 2002. Uh, In that same year, uh, the same people, the same financiers uh, fielded a previously unknown uh, black candidates against Congressman Earl Hilliard in Alabama, uh, in Alabama, uh, a left-leaning uh, congressman, and against Cynthia McKinney in Atlanta, Georgia, and defeated them both. These are the same money people. So it w- became very clear uh, that there was going to be a new era in black politics in which the hard right uh, was going to uh, use the same its same capital and its same tactics, its uh, same strategy of creating with its money out of whole cloth organizations and candidacies uh, to uh, challenge the old line uh, black Democrats, and that was something uh, that uh, it was very clear, uh, not just Sharp James in in Newark, uh, but the rest of the black. Uh, Democratic political establishment uh, was not prepared to confront because it had never happened before. So let's talk about Booker's election and ascent, which was simultaneous with Chris Christie, because the popular narrative in the mainstream national media saw these two as this kind of, you know, odd couple. They would not get along normally, but somehow they were able to get along on certain issues. And I wonder what your thinking is on that. Well, uh, Cory Booker uh, is a real right winger. Uh, He was not suborned, uh, forced off of traditional black uh, liberal democratic uh, politics by the lure of money. Uh, he's, He's the real deal. Uh, Cory Booker uh, was running uh, two uh, school, private school voucher, uh, excuse me, private uh, schools in North New Jersey and was part of that uh, whole network of private school uh, advocates who were seeking uh, school vouchers at the time. And that network uh, was a Republican uh, network. Uh, It it included uh, uh, lots of uh, Republican office holders. Uh, Just in 1999, I believe it was, uh, they were summoned by a group of corporations uh, to Milwaukee uh, to create an organization called the Black Alliance for Educational Options. And and that was uh, the group created out of as I said, whole cloth, just with uh, right-wing Republican corporate uh, funding, uh, to uh, create uh, a demand that had never existed in the black community before for uh, the public funding of private schools. And a whole ragtag uh, group of mostly uh, 
black Republican, but, but some uh, Democratic uh, politicians and assorted hustlers uh, manned this Black Alliance for Educational Options, uh, which was funded to the tune initially of two or three million dollars. Uh, but as soon as George Bush uh, got into office, since school vouchers were uh, uh, an essential part of the Republican platform, they were adopted by the Bush administration, uh, got uh, federal funding and a whole lot more private capital funding, and became a real presence on the national scene. And Cory Booker was a vice chair of the Black Alliance for Educational Options, and uh, along with uh, a former black congressman from Queens, Floyd Flake, who had been the most right-wing member of the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, they were the most prominent uh, members of this school privatizing factoid uh, on uh, newly arrived on the black scene. Uh, but they were basically a creation of the Republican Party. Uh, so, of course, uh, Cory Booker would have a working relationship with Chris, uh, Christie, uh, the top Republican in New Jersey. Uh, and any differences between the two or the kind that, uh, well, politicians routinely uh, concoct in order to make it look like uh, there's really a great deal of difference between the parties on issues uh, in which sometimes there is not. There's certainly no difference between Cory Booker on school privatization and uh, a host of, uh, of, of, of corporate issues uh, at all. So you've also been able to observe Cory Booker's arc of development simultaneous with the Obama presidency, and I wonder if you have any observations or thoughts having seen now, we're speaking just two days before the final moments of the Obama administration. If Cory Booker had won, instead of losing by just a few thousand votes, uh, his quest for the city hall in Newark in 2002, uh, he would have been uh, the, the Obama. He would have been the fair-haired uh, Democratic Leadership Council uh, black politician uh, of, of that time. Uh, but we succeeded in defeating him, and he didn't... Uh, he didn't gain that office until uh, 2006. Uh, it does appear uh, that he can anticipate being the next Obama in 2020, uh, since everybody is uh, bandying about uh, his name. And if anything, he will be a more right-wing Obama. Uh, he, he is, as I said, uh, the real article, a, a genuine uh, black uh, corporate uh, to the bone uh, politician who is, if anything, more fervent uh, about school privatization than Barack Obama, who is the king of school privatization. Although uh, Barack Obama uh, uh, was the greatest uh, gift uh, to charter schools, uh, Cory Booker uh, comes from an even older privatizing a tendency, and that is uh, to uh, give public aid uh, to private schools. So he would in, embrace that. Uh, and Cory Cory Booker shows up uh, with his old friends, uh, Republicans, many of them, uh, at uh, speaking engagements all of the time. So uh, when if if his candidacy does materialize for uh, 2020, and if there is uh, anything. Uh, <laughs> that would be worthy of the name of, of a progressive uh, opposition uh, in the Democratic Party, uh, he's going to be prime meat. Uh, there will be no lack of ammunition uh, to throw at Cory Booker uh, because he is a black Republican uh, and a, a denizen of the far, farthest uh, uh, recesses of uh, the old, now defunct because they won, Democratic Leadership Council. So, as this narrative in the media begins to evolve and further evolves, I anticipate, from a media studies perspective, seeing all sorts of things tried out, including 
the invocation of Martin Luther King and the legacy of the civil rights movement. So to justify Booker's ascent, I wonder if you have any insights or points to raise that would make particularly uh, white people and those who are not specifically savvy with the black radical tradition better understand why Booker is the complete antithesis of the black radical tradition that Martin Luther King stam came from. There is nothing uh, the least bit progressive about Cory Booker uh, except uh, his public stance on mass incarceration. Uh, that, that is the issue uh, in which he uh, speaks out uh, uh, rhetorically uh, with, with some force, although in substance he's really no more progressive than uh, a whole bunch of uh, libertarian uh, 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 Republicans, uh, but uh, on economic issues, uh, he votes uh, with the furthest right Democrats uh, and and uh, the bulk of the Republican uh, Party. Uh, just recently, for example, uh, he voted against the bill that would have allowed uh, U.S. Uh, public agencies uh, to buy uh, 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 drugs uh, abroad because the U.S. pharmaceutical industry, uh, in probably the most massive price-fixing situation that exists in the country, uh, sets these prices so high that American consumers basically uh, subsidize the cost of drugs uh, elsewhere in the world. Why? Uh, because they can, because they control uh, the reins of political power in this country. And Cory Booker uh, is right with them. And I was pleased to see uh, that he got outed uh, in terms of his uh, uh, economic uh, views, his pro-corporate views on that issue. But if people want to uh, look into uh, uh, his his entire history, they'll find more and more of that. That his his record uh, is uh, to the right of even the kind of center uh, that his colleagues in the old Democratic Leadership Council. We're advocating that the party go. You've been covering Cory Booker for such a long time. I wonder if in closing you have any points you would like to bring up or emphasize. Well, he's very uh, slick. Uh, he's not as intelligent uh, and talented as Barack Obama, but he's been adopted uh, by uh, some very talented media people. Uh, who have, uh, in his career, created uh, a bunch of, of films and uh, commercials uh, that are really top-of-the-line, uh, slick uh, presentations. Uh, so uh, a Cory Booker uh, campaign uh, would, would, I believe, uh, match, at least in, 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 in terms of a media splash, uh, that was, which was run around Barack Obama. Uh, despite the fact that he doesn't have uh, the talents and oratorical skills of an Obama, uh, you've got the right-wing corporate machinery uh, to uh, create uh, that, that, that kind of, of feel, uh, that kind of, uh, the kind of false excitement uh, that corporate media is good at. That's all we got for the time for today, folks. Thanks for listening, and tune in next time for another episode of Political Gingivitis. I'm your host, Andrew Stewart, and I want to remind you again, America's greatest social democratic period corresponded with the lives of those wonderful commies, Larry, Curly, and Moe. Yeah.